Hello, everyone. We are live. Uh, this is Postgres TV Open Talk series. Uh, I'm Nikolai Smachvala from Postgres AI, and today's guest is Dmitry Dalgov from Red Hat, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming, Dmitry. Thanks a lot for inviting me. So uh, I, I quickly rem will remind uh, the idea of uh, Postgres Open Talks. Uh, the idea is simple. We uh, want uh, every great talk to be publicly available for wide audience. So we invite people uh, uh, to redo, just redo the talk recently presented at some conference. And, uh, and we have some um, live audience. Uh, thank you, everyone who is watching live. And uh, you can ask questions in chat. I will be checking the chat all, all the time. And uh, I have the right permission to interrupt Dmitry and ask questions. Of course, as usual, I will have my own questions. And uh, actually, that's it. The sim simple rule, like the rule number one is no rules, actually. So we can do whatever that we want. Uh, no uh, restrictions, no uh, strict time frames, and so on. And uh, yeah, the topic. The topic is uh, actually uh, we had last last week we had uh, we we discussed uh, eBPF and how to use it to troubleshoot particular queries, uh, to extend the information that uh, uh, explain analyzed buffers can provide, and I guess today we continue the topic uh, at different angle, right? Yeah. So we are going to talk about something quite similar, but probably a little bit from even more high level perspective, because I'm not going to propose any particular solution as Ronan did, uh, but I would like to take a look at this problem just from the point of view, how is it going to be or how would it be uh, an ideal world in the future? Right, so the topic, this topic is not uh, very new for Linux world, but it looks like for Postgres world, it's starting to be like kind, kind of new thing. And uh, I expect uh, many new tools uh, and uh, methodologies uh, will be adjusted and the API will appear. So it's it's really interesting to learn about concepts as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, then we can start, I guess. Uh, I sure. already shared the screen. Give me a second. So please let me know if you can see my screen now. Uh, yeah, I can see it. Perfect. So first of all, I wanted to mention that I have a good news for you. I just realized that I don't remember that much about like in which words I was talking about this topic before. So probably what you will get right now is going to be absolutely new or at least to a certain degree an improvisation of the very same topic. So it's going to be unique content after all. Um, yeah. And yeah, probably I will have to introduce myself a little bit. So I'm Dimitri. I'm a, a software engineer at Red Hat and well, already for quite some years, Postgres contributor. Maybe you have heard even some patches or some features that I have developed. The recent one probably was about what generic subscription for uh, JSONV. Uh, yeah, and the topic, it's a very interesting topic indeed. And I'm sort of trying to promote this topic for already also for a couple of years now. It's nice to see that it's getting some more and more traction. So I hope I'm pretty positive about how Postgres will actually adopt this approach. And this talk is actually one part of this promotion. So we're going to talk about how to get more information from your Postgres, in fact. So it's all about getting visibility into the database. My favorite, um, my favorite analogy here or comparison is that uh, you know, it's quite similar when you would like to understand what's going on and you would like to understand, get more visibility into your Postgres. It's something similar to like, you know, a dungeon crawling or like exploring a dungeon because, you know, there is a lot of rooms that are dark and you have no idea what's going on. In some of them are treasures and some of them are some monsters and they're going to attack you. So, you know, there is a reward and danger at the same time. And even more similar to, you know, exploring the danger, the danger dungeon there, are various strategies how to obtain information from database. So normally, when you think about visibility for Postgres, the main strategy that everybody is using like 80% of time or 90% of time is just actually just to ask Postgres itself what Postgres thinks uh, about the current situation, what's going on from Postgres perspective. 
Uh, fortunately for us, there are a lot of informational views uh, that provides a lot, a lot of information, and this information is quite useful to get an understanding of Postgres' point of view on the current uh, well state of things, let's say this way. But the thing is that it's not the only strategy or not the only approach you can uh, try out. Another one would be actually to try and use some different techniques and different introspection techniques. And here I'm talking about Linux per system or in generally Linux introspection that Linux kernel provides us. Uh, essentially, this is a sort of a application independent approach, which means that it's of course not Postgres specific, but it still provides a lot, a lot of interesting um, information you can extract, but it's a little bit different. So the strategy of this whole approach is a bit different. So it takes time to get used to it. Uh, yeah, uh, although the talk has a pretty funny name, uh, party tricks and so on, we actually would have to start with a very, uh, well, very serious topic. We have to start with a use case for this approach because the point is that quite frequently what happens is that people not always realize why is it even important to look around for the information from the outside of the Postgres. So what is the problem? What's the big deal about this? And the uh, use case I'm going to talk about, you're probably also aware about this, uh, it's uh, overflow subtransactions. It's a very interesting problem that some amount of uh, users have stumbled upon over the last, I believe, year or two, something like this. And it turns out to be a really a problem. So uh, to summarize shortly, but, it's a situation when you... It's, sorry, this is, this is I, I, could, I cannot not interrupt you here. Uh, like yeah. I have a huge blog post about it and I there know. are several cases. Yeah, yeah, so, so this is my favorite topic. Maybe you can even give an introduction on your own about this problem. Right, so you, what I see on, on the screen is one of the cases when we have the problem on the primary. And it's like uh, we, exactly. we reach right. So we, we in some cases, uh, and as I remember, it, it's related when the ne like sub transactions is like nested transactions and uh, various ORM or, or object relational mapping systems like Rails or Django, and they they implemented it in they like presented to engineers like it's like really sub transactions. So you can have transactions inside transactions and so on. But if uh, And if nesting level is huge, like reaching very big depth, you can reach this overflow on the primary. But in reality, it's like, I I never saw it, this one. I had another one. And this one is mentioned in, in uh, mailing list, but there is another one which happens only on standby servers. And like so, so it's very. My conclusion was it's it's very painful. So I I started to recommend people try trying to avoid it if you have heavy load, and there is a, there is a work uh, to improve this in terms of the size of exactly. caches and so. On. So this is a gist of it essentially. So yeah, there is a performance degradation that you can and quite severe performance degradation indeed if we're getting out of this limit, which is actually not that big as you can see here. And yeah, so the, the situation is indeed quite a complicated how to get there. So we have to get most likely a long running transaction, most for example, if we're talking about the primary. And then you have to get all these uh, like uh, uh, sub transactions and they have to uh, quite a lot of them. And then you most likely also have to get some other backends that would like to get a snapshot of your long running transaction. So it's actually a little bit tricky situation, but still there is a it's use case when people are complaining about this indeed. So uh, the core of the problem is not important because there are also discussion about this. There are different approaches how to address the problem and interesting developments going on. But in this use case, I wanted to actually emphasize one particular uh, situation. The thing is that in the discussion, there were a couple of suggestions about how to actually make this problem visible or like how to get an introspection to it. Like how let people know that they are facing this particular problem. And surprisingly, uh, those suggestions or proposals uh, were actually faced with some amount of objections. Well, okay, some of them were, they were just too expensive to do. They were introducing too much overhead for reporting. That's perfectly fine. Some of them were objected on the account that it makes sense to solve the problem in the first place instead of reporting it, because reporting is not really solving it, right? Which makes sense to a certain degree. But yeah, the problem is that it's not solved yet. It's not yet implemented. And uh, as far as I understand, there is no, no a single solution that everybody agrees upon, which means that probably we'll see it in some distant view. Well, not necessarily distant, but maybe in a couple of releases, we'll see the so solution for this problem. In the meantime, you have to live with it somehow. And especially those people who are stumbling upon this and have a lot of problems with this, 
well, they would probably like to get some visibility around this topic, uh, which they have problems to get actually. And it turns, uh, the problem is that this type of situation happens uh, more frequently than we would like to. Uh, because and it's perfectly clear why. So just a couple of examples. I was uh, searching through the mailing list uh, while preparing this presentation. I think I have found the patch about information so PG stat toast information, which was also objected on the account of performance overhead. Uh, similar example were, for example, original naive implementation for full page full page rights reporting, which was also introduced uh, in somehow a little bit weird way, but nevertheless it was also rejected because it was introduced into much performance. So uh, the point here is that it again it makes total sense. There are just a limited amount of resources and only, you know, it's all possible to report only so much of things out of pretty much infinite possibility of various information you can actually get up the database. Which means that we have to concentrate indeed on something that makes sense to report something really valuable. Uh, valuable for the most users that are actually using the database, which means that uh, we have to somehow manage our resources, but at the same time, this approach also means that there will be always a small portion of people who are actually dissatisfied with this reporting mechanism because they do not get what they want. There will be always this gray area when Postgres just will not let you know about what's going on because it just, you know, it's just too much overhead, unfortunately, and it's not justifiable for your particular use case because the portion of people who face it is just small, almost invention is small. Uh, but this type of situation, so just to mention, uh, before the time, uh, time point, point in time when I was giving this presentation originally, and now fortunately the discussion about this problem is going on, and apparently thanks to the insistence of Robert Haas, probably this is going to land at some point, which is a great news, but nevertheless the idea is still the same. It's not possible to report everything, which means that Postgres will not always get you all the information you know you, you would like to get. <clears throat> When, when you when you say report, uh, you mean, for example, weight events in pages activity, right? Or or yeah. Blocks. So, for example, about this particular problem is going to be a new column in pages that activity. Yeah. Ah, new column. Okay, because there, there is yeah. an, uh, in our chat uh, already some discussion. Uh, sub trans control log uh, will pop up in weight event. Uh, if you oh, that right could be probably case. also one interesting approach in the sense, yeah. Right. So essentially, when I'm talking, just uh, uh, to clarify, when I'm talking here about reporting, I'm talking about this from the general point of view. It could be some value in the informational view. It could be maybe even a log message or something like this, something that you as a, a DBA or user can actually just, you know, get your hands on and get this information. To, to maybe say that that the... overflow happened, right? And how many times exactly. it happened and so on. I see. I see. Exactly. Actually, already there is a question how to what to do about this log uh, if we cannot remove, if we cannot eliminate sub transactions. But this is actually <laughs> it's a good question, uh, which is not directly related to observability, right? Because that's true. It's a very good question, and to be honest, I don't know to heal it. We only want, want sorry, we want to, to only to do diagnosis, not to to heal the 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 problem right so here but the exactly. question is good question is good question is very good maybe we can post at the end of the day maybe we can post a couple of those threads with all the advice that people are giving because i just don't remember all of them <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 okay so uh, nevertheless uh, in such situations it's essentially a justification to try out something different to understand what's going on right and here on the slide i was trying to compose an ideal example of how could we use linux per subsystem to actually understand uh, or like, you know, get more information about the sub overflow transactions, <clears throat> sub transact overflow sub transactions problem. So uh, what I'm saying here is actually, I'm, I'm showing this step by step because it's so much different from what we usually do in Postgres. That's why I put it here on the slide in a separate way. So what are we doing here is we're essentially recording some information that we have created upfront some trace point and this trace point provides us necessary information. So it means that we are recording some files, so recording some information, some events that are going coming from Postgres. We are putting them into a file and then analyze this information. So in this example, in ideal world, we essentially get in something that we're saying, okay, we've got an event from Postgres from this and that uh, backend process ID where we're actually executing this function. And we see that the parameter we have here, it's not something cryptic, it's actually a number of sub transactions that we would like to monitor. And then we have to somehow compare it with the threshold that we have. So it's a little bit more complicated approach, I agree with it, but still it's the only or 
probably only way how to do this in this particular situation. So again, it's an ideal world, but we'll come back to this slide probably in a couple of more uh, minutes. <clears throat> because first of all, we have to actually understand how this whole instrumentation works. Uh, the reason is that I have seen it quite frequently. Unfortunately, people are uh, used to do this blindly. People just take this as a black magic. They just take all those terminal commands as like some sort of magical incantations, which means that if you apply this in a, in some context when it doesn't make sense, or for example, when it hits some limitations, you will get probably some unexpected results, which means it definitely makes sense to understand how this whole approach works under the hood. So uh, generally speaking, when we're talking about instrumentation from the Linux point of view, we have a different uh, resources we could use. So the most straightforward and probably the first thing you need to think about as a static tracing, which is represented in the uh, internal uh, via tracing points for your know, internal space and user standard defined trace points for user space. So actually, both of them are very important, but I was actually covering in some blog posts in the past the kernel side of things because uh, you can use it for monitor various resources quite efficiently. So we're going to concentrate here mostly on the user space part of things. So what is it all about? It's essentially a part of your definition. You can define on your own which information you would like to expose using this whole machinery. What does it take? It takes essentially you to modify your code slightly. You don't have to like introduce huge changes. So you just have to put in some particular, for example, like at the beginning of a fraction or at the beginning when you use some resource, you have to put this definition. I would like to expose this trace point with this in-depth information attached to it. And that's pretty much it. Usually it means that you have to compile your project with a system tab library or the trace library, something like this. And those are actually providing you this mechanism, underlying mechanism, how to use it. At the same time, static tracing all those trace points are actually quite important, not only because you can get some information about this, but also when you're learning about them, it, you can consider it as a sort of a documentation, performance documentation about your project. Because every time when, for example, you experiment with a project and, you know, for example, you read the source code, right? You read the implementation and you see there is a trace point exposed at this point with these parameters. It means that the author thought it's important to expose this information for performance point of view which means that there is something to look after and then you can check it out. Why is it even, why does it have to be there? Why do we have to monitor this information? But the problem is that, as I mentioned before, you still have to modify your uh, project, your source code to actually introduce these small modifications, so, uh, expose this trace point, register them and so on and so forth. In the situation when even this is not possible, it's a small modification, but sometimes you don't have any access whatsoever or you would like to troubleshoot something quick and dirty, you could do dynamic tracing. Uh, dynamic tracing is actually represented by two resources, again, kernel and user space. So it's a K probes and user probes. Uh, what happens here is that essentially you can define those. It's quite similar to normal trace points, a static trace points, but you can define them almost everywhere you want if you have enough debugging information about the programs you're running, which means that you literally can get information about almost any instruction in your program as you wish. And another thing I wanted to mention, there is also a third resource called kfunks uh, alongside with the kprobes. And just an interesting point because it's sort of important to uh, mention this, although it's a relatively new stuff. So the thing is that when you are using all this machinery, the overhead is usually negligible when you do not use them. So if you just enable this information in your program, enable possibility of doing this, but not use it. There is almost no overhead whatsoever. If you use this information, especially with k-probes, and especially if you use a return probes, then you may see a situation when, for example, before, because of the bandwidth limitation that k-red probes have, you can see, for example, a quite strange situation when you're just missing some events. It's quite annoying, unfortunately. That's why you may use k funks, which is essentially the same way, the same thing, but it's implemented with the BPF tramp alliance under the hood, which means that it's faster. And most likely, you're not going to lose those events because of the performance bandwidth. So how uh, does it work under the hood? For static trace points, as I mentioned before already, you have to modify your source code and include some lines saying, here is a trace point. Uh, what happens under the hood is that when you compile your project, uh, instead of those at this moment in time, at this point in the code, uh, no operation will be inserted into your program. And then at the end of the day, when you would like to uh, int get introspection, you'd like to sample those trace points, those no operation interaction are going to be replaced with actual, some actual pointers to something that is going to be doing this monitoring for you. 
Uh, similar situation happens with the dynamic tracing as well. Uh, you essentially just replace certain instructions dynamically on the fly that are going to do some extra logic for you. So here in the slide, I've put an example from the user's probe, from user, uh, user space. Uh, this is just some function from some program type I've got somewhere. It's called handle event. And the top part of the slide, you can see it just uh, the, how this function looks like, how the instructions for this function looks like normally. They like we're pushing something into the stack. We're just moving something and so on. So normal stuff. As soon as I would like to uh, do a dynamic tracing, as soon as I'd like to trace this function, we see that we attach uh, dynamic trace points to it, and we see that suddenly our, our push instruction is getting replaced by an interrupt. This interrupt is getting caught at the end of the day by this whole subsystem, and then necessary bits are getting involved and getting pulled to actually do this monitoring and sampling for you. Uh, which means that at the end of the day, it's essentially a dynamic replacement or dynamic modification of your code on the fly. Uh, unfortunately, it also means that there is going to be an extra context switch between user and kernel space. So there are some performance implications of that, but we're going to cover this in a moment. So <clears throat> uh, I guess that's pretty much enough for theory how it works, because uh, those bits are uh, the essentials what we need to understand about this whole uh, approach. Now let's see how could we use it. Fortunately for us, in Postgres, we already have some amount of static trace point defined, and usually they are enabled for many distributions with a configuration called enable dtrace. Usually it's enabled by default almost everywhere now. You can verify it if they're enabled or not and what kind of trace points you get by, for example, using VPF trace with minus L command, and then you say, please like list all the user uh, user probes that you have, user static uh, trace points. And then I think, I don't remember the number, there is some decent amount of trace points in Polgros, about 100 or something. So it, it's not overwhelming amount of information, but it's some decent chunk of stuff that covers basics, what's going on under the hood. And then you see I have highlighted here something about the checkpoint, for example. So how are we going to use it? Here is an example on the slide. We could be a fancy and we could use VPF trace for that. And then we're essentially going to say that, please uh, check uh, attached to a check pointer here because we're going to look, listen to the check pointer. Converted, we're going to be fancy to the end. And we're going even to convert this report into a JSON format. And then we're saying, please listen to a static trace point called checkpoint start. This is essentially a trace point that's getting hit or getting fired when checkpoint is starting. And not only it represents this information that checkpoint is doing something, it also shows us we can also collect a flag that were passed into the um, checkpoint when it's getting started, which means we also understand the reason why it was like that. And then sure enough, we're getting an information about this. And in this particular case, I was uh, keeping checkpoint a couple of times manually to actually trigger some results and see, sure enough, we're getting the record about this and the flags that were passed inside as an argument. So as I mentioned before, static trace points is the thing to go because they're stable. Uh, essentially, since they are part of the source code, it means that they have to be stable across various releases. And that's what makes them so special. Uh, if you, for example, would like to build a project around the stuff, that's the first thing you have to work with because, yeah, as I said before, you do not have to do anything. They are just there. And usually breaking changes about trace points happening quite rarely. The different situation is about dynamic tracing. The problem here is that if you're using this, and that's one of the objections why people quite frequently say that it's a bad idea, if you would like to do this on a constant basis, uh, you, have to, uh, com you have to think about how are you going to do dynamic tracing between different versions. Because even the smallest changes, for example, between the minor patch versions of the Postgres could actually change something, and then your uh, dynamic probe is not going to work. Uh, so plus now, overhead, right? If you want to do it constantly, you should think about overhead. Yeah, that's true. And I also will mention this, I think, in a couple of more slides. Uh, but what I'm going to show now is actually an example. So finally, we are turning to the previous example uh, with the overflow subtransactions. So I'm going to show roughly what could you theoretically do to obtain this information and how to get this. It's not an exact, not necessarily like industrial grade approach. So probably it's a good idea to not do this right away in your production, but it gives you like a, an idea how does it work under the hood. So first of all, we actually need to understand where could we put our dynamic trace point. Uh, fortunately, it's relatively easy, so we could just ask Perth to do this for us. So we're saying, please, with the minus add parameter, please show us all the lines 
where we could put some trace point in a function called get new transaction ID. Uh, sure enough, we literally get a list of all the slides and we're finding something that's somehow suitable for our purposes where we're just getting a number of sub transactions like in this particular example. Just to verify that it's actually what we need and to verify what other variables and information available is available at this line, at this, uh, this point, we could also ask Perf uh, to show us the available information here. And sure enough, we get, uh, for example, here, transaction ID, full seed, it's a substate, and the last one is what we're looking for, the number of uh, sub-transactions. Uh, and then the rest is essentially what I was uh, talking about before. So we, first of all, have to register our dynamic trace points. We're doing this with the uh, probe command. It's relatively straightforward. The only trick here is that we're also saying, please record along this line also this variable that we're looking for. And then as soon as we have registered this uh, trace point, every time when uh, Postgres is actually hitting this dynamic trace point, we're going to get some information, some events out of it. We're going to record this trace point we have record we have created using record command, and then at the end of the day, we're going to analyze the file that we have created, analyze the samples that we have collected, and then, sure enough, not only we're getting information that we actually have hit this particular uh, trace point, so this trace point was fired, also get an information. So in this particular case, the load I was applying, I was unfortunately too lazy to actually simulate this whole sub overflow transaction. So here we see there are, there are no sub overflow tra sub transactions whatsoever. So it looks very shiny, straightforward and powerful, right? Uh, that's true, it's very powerful. We get a lot, we can get a lot of information, but obviously there are some limitations and caveats because if there would be none of such things, obviously everybody would be doing this, right? So we do not see uh, all the DBA suddenly playing around with Perf and there is a reason for it because there are quite interesting limitations you need to understand. Before we, go, before we go to limitations, let me just express uh, wow, because I, I, like, I, I knew Perf is very, very powerful but of course, I like as many of us, I just used uh, top, perf top and perf record to draw some flame graph. It was already a lot of uh, magic uh, for many, like, and like, and, but this is very, like, it's, this is super cool. Like I, I, I definitely uh, will record this part of uh, this presentation and, and try to do it because actually uh, limitations, right? So like, my opinion is that perf should be installed everywhere and debug symbols should be installed everywhere on any production because overhead is like virtually zero if you don't use it but in the case if you, if you have trouble and you need troubleshooting of course it's not possible if you have postgres like managed like rds or something but but if you manage postgres yourself this is what you should have uh, debug symbols and and perf and uh like i i'm very curious what will you tell us now? Uh, I, I'm going to consider this recipe as uh, like uh, to be in my arsenal if some troubles happen. Okay. Definitely, I would also recommend this. And in fact, uh, as far as I know, there are some uh, people out there who are doing exactly this, what you were saying. They have either a perf always by default installed on their systems, or for example, they have even more advanced stuff, like for example, they have BPF trace, their BCC tool and all this stuff. So for example, as far as I understand in the Netflix cloud, they're doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are some objections to it sometimes, for example, that you yeah, sometimes you do not would not like to install an extra stuff and so on. It's a, a a little bit religious topic, unfortunately. Uh, uh, that's why I'm not like talking about this that much. But yeah, I definitely agree with you that it totally makes sense actually to have it pretty much everywhere just by default. Just to to have prepared if troubleshooting exactly. is right, yeah. right. Good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, now about limitations. So the first one, and that's what you were mentioning before about the performance. So uh, there is some performance that we. Uh, performance penalty that we have to pay when we're using this. So uh, generally speaking, it's actually not that high. So depending on the situation, it's actually not a problem, especially if you do not have that much of a frequency for those events. But just to give you a ballpark numbers, for example, about especially about switch context, switch overhead, that's essentially when we're, for example, measuring something in kernel, we do not have it. We usually measure everything inside kernel and it's not going outside of the user space. But if we're talking about user probe, then it has to be doing this context switch for every user probe. 
And for example, when I was experimenting with this with BPF programs, when I was monitoring a lightweight log, logs in Postgres, uh, under the normal uh, uniform loads, when we're essentially doing like PG bench something, uh, the overhead was actually not that significant, but as soon as we were switching it to make it a little bit more aggressive, more log heavy, the workload, I mean, then I was actually, because, just because simply of this switch overhead, I was getting about 30% of overhead, which is of course quite a significant difference in the sense. But it's a very artificial use case in the sense, because I was applying a particular workload specified to actually exercise this use case. And at the same time, you know, lightweight logs are everywhere. So it's a, like a, it's a machinery in Postgres is getting used quite a lot. So it's a special use case. So if you know that, for example, you would like to monitor something about, I don't know, about IO operation or something that happens not as frequent as lightweight log, for example, then you probably should be okay. And uh, uh, last week, Ronan also showed example difference. Like uh, his idea was to analyze the code execution, and he showed that if you have, like, for example, million rows, uh, and this is loop, and if you uh, are tracing inside the loop, it's uh, like overhead will be high. But if you're just waiting all uh, million uh, rows to be processed and only then have summary, it's just one one call so overhead is low this is also an example. yeah that's actually the biggest part behind bpf for example and that's why bpf oh, well it's actually extended bpf right so that's why extended bpf is so great is that you can do a lot of stuff inside the kernel without doing this switch and the whole thing about extended bpf is that it's stateful so you can store this information between the runs and like do aggregates all this crazy stuff and it's really it's really helpful when you don't have to switch between spaces when you're doing this process, and that's true. So um, another limitation you're also mentioning this it, that it's not really a limitation, but it's something to keep in mind because most likely if most like most of the time you need some debugging symbols to actually be able to get much more information from Postgres. But yeah, again, it's not a big problem because it's just something you have to install. Usually they are provided with pretty much any distributions. So it's just a matter of uh, incorporating this in your infrastructure. Now post-processing is something a little bit more annoying. So I was showing this example before about sub-transactions. And one thing I was not actually mentioning, I was a little bit like cheating in the sense. We were getting an information about number of sub-transactions, but uh, we have to also somehow compare it with a threshold, right? So there is some limit that we're not fitting in. And this comparison, we were not doing directly with Perf. And here is a sort of a problem here. Unfortunately, Perf does not allow us to do any particular expressions over the information we're collecting. So any, any arbitrary expression, unfortunately, are not supported. Which means that quite frequently, the situation happens like this, that we're collecting some information, some samples, and then we have to somehow store this information and then we have to post-process it, like apply those essentially arbitrary expressions that we would like to, to actually squash information into results we would like. Another example, I was also playing around with this for the presentation. Another example of similar situation would be a very interesting idea that was recently popped up about uh, letting people know if the auto vacuum was actually kicked in because of the inserted uh, tuples threshold, because it was something relatively new and there was no reporting about this, or at least as far as I'm aware, it's not as of uh, and until this moment in time, I think there was nothing new about this. Uh, and theoretically, it's also an information that you can extract right away from Postgres using Perf and the very same approach, but the way how is it all implemented, um, makes it so that, again, you have to do this post-process. You have to first extract the number of inserted uh, tuples, and then you have also insert this threshold, uh, after which you're going to kick a not vacuum in. And then you have to do this post-processing about comparing uh, uh, those two. So that's a little bit unfortunate and, uh, let's say, unnecessary. But yeah, I don't know any other solution, unfortunately. And one really, really important point is about actually how to put it into your infrastructure. It's a bigger topic than we think about because, uh, well, you know, quite frequently it happens that people are saying, the hell I'm going to install, yeah, indeed, as you were mentioning, the hell I'm going to install Perf on my clusters and my Kubernetes, wherever I'm going to run the database. So we're going to address this topic in a couple of coming slides. So I'm going to skip this one. Actually, Perf, Perf inside containers also a question. 
that's true actually well i mean uh thing is that perf is actually getting much much smarter uh, over the time and i think perf already knows about containers quite a lot already starting from uh, i don't know even kernel 4 19 or 18 it was already getting a lot of information about this so theoretically it's not a big problem uh especially if you would like to get information if, especially if you're essentially sampling from within the container itself because then you of course will not see what happens under you you well under you in a sense that you will not be able to see processes outside of your like process space right or like network connections outside your network namespace but you will still be able to see quite a lot of information there are still uh, quite isn't... annoying isn't yeah. container uh, i think it has to be running in privileged mode no that's what i'm going yeah. to cover in the okay okay the, the next point yeah privileges yeah it has to be running most of the time in the privileged mode and that's why pre quite frequently people are actually creating this uh, sort of a tooling boats uh, that you're going to for example connect to your container or like a tooling container that you're going to run in a privileged mode and then attach to your application as a, like a separate thing so yeah generally speaking if you would like for example to use bpf programs or you would like to create those uh, trace points, you have to get some elevated privileges, which is, of course, quite annoying. I think since kernel 5.2, it was a little bit relaxed to the point that you actually have to get non, not a syscap, not sysadmin uh, privileges, but sysbpf for loading BPF programs and sysperf for using perf, but still it's, they're quite elevated. And it totally makes sense because they're hell scary. You could do a lot of uh, stuff having these privileges, so they have to be limited. And unfortunately, I don't see that it's going to be relaxed in the sense, but uh there are ways to limit there are ways to limit necessity for such privileges uh, and we're going to talk about this again uh, as well in a moment and, uh, right uh, ronald talking about mbpf mentioned uh, uh, we talked about it, uh, it, it 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 sounded very scary that you can change behavior of postgres absolutely this this is like i'm going to actually show one of the slides where you could use it for your own purposes but yeah it's definitely very scary so infrastructure, uh, this slide here is sort of a placeholder. So I'm going to talk a lot about it, but it's just one of the examples. So do not like read it right away. Uh, I'm just going to give you an overview. So infrastructure, the thing is that uh, what we have nowadays is that there are already existing uh, commercial and even open source projects that are actually using this very same approach. They're giving you some possibilities of using this whole machinery, for example, to get some, I don't know, security information, security audit, or, for example, to get some observability for your system using exactly these approaches. So the thing is that, uh, in theory, they already have solved this problem about incorporating this in pretty much any infrastructure you wish. So it could be like, I don't know, Kubernetes, OpenShift, some bare metal, whatever. It's already solved, it's just not part, it's not like a specified for Postgres, right? So it's not Postgres specific. So in this sense, probably the only thing that we have to do as a community is just be a little bit more friendly to use this approach. And then essentially there should be already some other ways to actually help to incorporate this into your infrastructure. And to be more precise, there are a couple of very interesting things that could make it quite easy. Uh, and that's what I was mentioning about uh, minimizing the surface when you need an elevated privileges. Uh, the problem here, or like the problem in the past, was that when you, for example, would like to load a BPF program, you have to also get a process associated with it. And this process has to be, yeah, it, first of all, it has to get this elevated privileges, and then it has to live for the whole time frame when your BPF program is active, which is quite annoying. Fortunately, what happens nowadays with the modern kernels is that you can actually have a loader for a BPF program that is going to have these elevated privileges, but it's going to only load BPF program, pin it in the memory, so that it's going to stay in the memory in the kernel, and then essentially just exit, leaving this program running and doing whatever it's supposed to be doing. So, which means that in this uh, situation, you need an, a, project, uh, a process with elevated privileges only for a short amount of time when you load and stuff into the memory. And after that, what happens is that you get these programs attached whenever they have to be attached. They are listening to the events, they are processing them, they're writing something into BPF maps that are also pinned in the memory. And then uh, the trick is that uh, you can create, for example, a user agent that is going to read those BPF maps. And as far as I recall, you don't even have to get those uh, elevated privileges only for reading this information. So in this case, you can really minimize the surface. And generally speaking, 
this whole idea about uh, incorporating, uh, for example, BPF programs in your infrastructure, uh, there are already projects that are actually taking over of significant part of this whole idea for you. For example, there is BPF daemon, for example, the whole idea behind this is actually to provide your life cycle to manage those BPF programs, which means that this daemon, you can create it like a daemon set in your Kubernetes or something, and it's going to load those BPF programs for you. It's going to manage their life cycle. It can manage the order that you're going to execute them and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, essentially, you just have to re like register this, and somehow you know you have to create this program and put it in there, and then everything is going to be theoretically already managed. Of course, disclaimer: all those projects I'm talking about, there are still some sort of an under active disk like development, which means that there are most likely there is some amount of functionality that is going to work out of the box, but it's not like an ideal world at the moment. But there is definitely an, an, a direction that everybody is looking into and. I can, I'm pretty sure that at some point, all of these questions are actually going to be sorted out. This is what I've heard about uh, Brandon Gregg's book on eBPF, quite recent book. Like it's mm -hmm. so so quickly changing. So you read the book and it's not working exactly like that. And so it's yeah, hard to yeah, definitely. Actually, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> about the book. That I'm actually going to mention this as well because, uh, well, what you have here on the slide is a very interesting thing. When we're talking about infrastructure, the trick is that using Ftrace subsystem and Linux kernel, you don't even have to install literally anything to get quite a crazy information from, uh, from under the hood, from under the hood of your Postgres. You literally have uh, only configure Ftrace using a virtual file system on the Linux without literally installing anything. And then you can get something like this, like you would see on the screen. On the screen. So what happens here is that we are collecting a histograms of latencies of a queries that were executed against database without repeat without installing anything like how crazy is that uh, this whole subsystem works in a very interesting way and that's why i'm going to show in a couple of more slides because the very interesting thing i wanted to go through this uh, how to actually achieve this how to get this information because i mean i wanted to show how it works the first step we have to do here is we have to create those probes that we're going to listen to. So we have to create one probe at the beginning of query execution and another probe when we are finishing executing our query, because yeah, this essentially we're the measurement of our latency for query, right? And now, I mean, I was mentioning that it's a pretty crazy amount of information we can collect out of nothing. So you can imagine something really crazy is coming on, right? And sure enough, that's what you've got. That's a very intimidating set of information, very, very intimidating set of instructions. But I'm going to show you in a moment that it's actually not that complicated as it looks like. The thing is that, and I mean, just think about this. I put all of the things into one slide. Like how more concise could that be? Uh, so uh, what's going on here? Here we have four steps. I'm going to show uh, and go through one of the steps one by one, but every step goes uh, in the following, uh, well, follows the same pattern. We are uh, finding ourselves, the current directory is a sysfs kernel debug, so it's a tracefs, and all the, the first line always represents the file we're working with, and the second line represents the content of this file. So uh, to actually implement this whole idea about uh, getting histograms, we first have to define a synthetic event. It sounds a little bit uh, dangerous, but it's actually nothing else than just a data structure that is going to carry our information. So we're going to create a synthetic event called query latency, and surely enough, it's going to contain latencies and just a query string, nothing else. Then we are going to uh, do something about the starting point, the first probe we have created. So every time when it's getting triggered, we're going to remember the process ID, the backend process ID, and the timestamp when this uh, event was triggered. When the second probe is getting triggered, so the finish of the query, we have to do some bookkeeping. So we have to like, you know, calculate latencies and so on. That's why we're doing a little bit more things. But here again, is quite simple actually. We're remembering the backend, process ID, we're calculating latencies just by doing the difference between timestamps, and then we're matching the, um, the, the, execution, the, the execution, the event to the previous uh, probe that we have actually executed. So we have to do this matching, you know, we have to remember that it's the same backend. And then if they're matching, we're actually firing, we're creating this synthetic event with the information we have collected. 
And then at the end of the day, as soon as we have fired this uh, synthetic event, we're just saying, hey, please collect uh, histograms out of this event for us. That's pretty much it. F-Trace will do this for us. And at the end of the day, we'll get what I was showing before, this information, which I wanted to remind you, it's almost like PG star statements. It's a histogram of latencies for queries. Again, I'm cheating a little bit, unfortunately, because it's uh, a queries that are not jumbled, unfortunately, which means that most likely you will get at some point overwhelmed with queries that uh, look similar, but not quite. So they're a little bit different because they are not, not generalized. But actually, this problem could be avoided in many different ways. For example, we could use a query ID or something like this. So it's a solvable problem. We just probably have to do a little bit more and probably have to involve some more things than just F-Trace uh, by itself. But this minimal, minimal example actually shows what could be done with F-Trace. What I was mentioning before about uh, the, the book about system performance, the example I'm showing here is actually heavily inspired by a similar example from this book from Brandon Brack. So now, before we were talking about the stuff that was extremely useful for you know for users of the database, or for admins, or for people who would like to understand what's going on. Interesting thing is that there are also different categories of people to whom this approach could be extremely useful. For example, so, people. So, sorry, I, I I interrupting in the wrong moment, but I just wanted to small like to have small pause and like this is gr so great. Like again, like we we have persistent statements and uh, all, like quite popular criticism of persistent statements. It, it just has mean mean times, uh, max times, uh, and averages. That's it. A total, of course. But uh, of course, for good analysis, we need histograms. Right. So here you are showing how without any extensions uh, to have it. But what about overhead of this particular? Have you measured uh, of this particular? Approach? Overhead is going to be similar as we've got before with uh, trace points, with the dynamic trace points. So essentially, uh, the whole overhead is going to be happening because we're going to do context switch two times. So yeah, it's going to be relatively high if you're hitting, for example, queries quite frequently. But at the same time, I can imagine it's also not that big because it's like the still lightweight logs are happening more frequently. So I can imagine there will be some visible overhead, maybe a couple of persons, mm -hmm. something like this. But uh, so depending on the situation, if it's worth it for you to actually trade this overhead for this information, then I, I'm pretty sure it definitely makes sense. Unfortunately, I have not measured it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but it boils down to two context switches, I guess. So, so if you have a lot of very, very fast, like sub millisecond queries, overhead will yeah. be more noticeable. If you have uh, like heavy yeah. queries, it's less noticeable. Yeah. Great. Generally, it's actually very interesting. That's an example of what I was saying about what, what you were mentioning before. Uh, this F trace thing and this F trace subsystem is getting actually also up to speed. And sometimes change, changes are appearing quite frequently and unexpectedly. So maybe, mm -hmm. maybe there is something more to come here to actually improve this uh, performance situation. Because the thing is that originally F-Trace was designed to actually facilitate kernel development. Mm -hmm. And almost the whole machinery is actually designed to work mostly with the kernel stuff without context switch. So using this for user props is somewhat unconventional way, I would say, but still it's pretty possible and it's still it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So about deployment, oh, sorry, development, a professional deformation thing about deployments. So development, uh, there are a couple of very interesting approaches how uh, people who are actually developing patches could use to, for example, I don't know, try to break their patches or try to analyze performance of what's going on. And one particularly interesting I find is an event memory, uh, uh, memory events. So uh, it's actually a part of the Percept system that uh, tells you or let you know when something or some program, some process was touching one particular address in memory. Uh, it looks a little bit obscure, but the way how I was trying to experiment with this is quite interesting. What you could do is you could run your Postgres backend and then get uh, an address of your shared buffers from the S maps and then figure out, for example, an address of one particular page in memory you're interested in. For example, this uh, buffer buffer pages, I don't know, it's underlying page for some relation or something of this, uh, something of this sort. And then using this approach, you, for example, can record and sample every single process that is touching this memory, trying to read from this or write uh, to this address. So essentially, it means that you will see every process that works with this page. 
And not only you will get uh, an information, something has touched this page number. You also get the whole stack trace that leads you to this particular uh, point in time, which means that you literally will be able to analyze and understand why Postgres decided to touch this part of the memory, which is extremely invaluable when you would like to sometimes, for example, troubleshoot something or uh, understand why some parts of memory are actually getting accessed. And here, that's what we were talking about, the scary part. So the thing is that a BPF is actually as a subsystem is getting more and more destructive in a sense. So one of the interesting things, for example, that was merged in a recent merge window for, I think, 6.1 was, for example, a BPF program that could do a kernel panic or like dump, core dump, for example, so something of this sort. Uh, here on this slide, I'm showing an example of another scary thing is where we are actually overriding a return uh, code of some particular syscall. Uh, how could it be useful? It could be useful, for example, if you would like to do some sort of a chaos testing for your Postgres, for your database. So on this particular example, we are trying to overwrite pwrite64 when we would like to essentially write something. And we're saying, please override the result of this syscall only for Postgres backends, override it to minus 12, which is no mem. So essentially an error code that is going to be sent when there is not enough memory to actually allocate something. And as soon as we have attached this BPF program using BPF trace, uh, sure enough, uh, we would like, for example, to create a table and then Postgres will complain that it, it's going to uh, panic because there is not enough memory to allocate for write ahead log, for example. And in this way, you can actually see without any uh, fiddling with, for example, virtual machines or with any kind of containers to simulate, for example, a lack of memory or something, you can essentially simulate this type of situation and see how your changes are actually behaving in such an extreme situations. Yeah. And now, uh, just a set of interesting tips and tricks that I find quite useful and most likely they will make your life a little bit easier when you would like to pick up this approach, this whole approach about using Perf and VPF. So one important thing that I have learned myself when uh, using this technique was that it's not only about getting samples and like getting an events recorded somewhere, it's also about meta information that you're attaching to those samples because at some point you realize you just have too much data collected and you have no idea what is actually inside of this data. So you have to attach some meta information to it, you know, some Postgres configuration, for example, something else. And along those lines, you can actually use minus minus header option that will give you a lot of meta information just essentially for free, which is quite useful. Another example of very useful approach that goes in the same direction is the archive command. Uh, to give you a context, the thing is that quite frequently it happened that you have to profile your Postgres that runs somewhere on the remote machine in the cloud, wherever else. And the problem is that when you do this, uh, Perf will collect all the debugging symbols that are located on this remote machine. And frequently, you would like to actually analyze the result of this perf record on your local machine, which means that when you're going to transfer this data, all those links are getting are going to get broken. To prevent this, to still would be to still be able to read these debugging symbols, you can actually uh, archive the data you have collected before uh, pulling it into your uh, laptop or local machine or whatever. And then in this way, perf just essentially literally fetch all those debugging information from every, everywhere across the system and then provide you a single tar archive that you can analyze pretty much independently from any system that you're working with. Uh, now another very interesting trick. So yeah, you have probably noticed that we're finally landing into the section about uh, party tricks. Uh, then our very extremely useful approach is to actually run Perf in a sort of a background mode, in the demonized mode. So uh, the context here is the following. Uh, from my own experience, I have noticed that quite frequently you would like to analyze performance uh, problems that are actually happening just like, you know, sporadically. So they're just anomalies that happens at some particular moment in time. So the, you do not see the constant performance degradation. It just happens, I don't know, every now and then on a blue moon. And it's very expensive if you do this constantly, if you just run perf constantly profiling Postgres, not because the profiling overhead by itself, but because you have to constantly write the data to the disk. And that's what's going to kill the performance overall on your cluster. This is very annoying. And instead, what you could do is you could run perf in this demonized mode saying, please, do the sampling as you, do, you usually do, but without writing anything at the disk. Instead, 
use the read buffer where you store the samples and override them when it's full, just start from the beginning overwriting the results. In this sense, you're just getting the last ring buffer of results that you have collected from, uh, from the database. And then as soon as you're getting some signal, just dump the content of the ring buffer and then you could analyze it. Which means that the workflow is going to be like this. You run perf in a demonized mode, you have a Postgres running in the background, and as soon as you notice that there is some anomaly, so you walk, for example, you're watching your Grafana or something, and you see that suddenly something is going on, you're sending this signal to perf, perf is going to dump the content of ring buffer, and then you could analyze this last sample of the data without actually that much of an overhead, and it's quite convenient at the end of the day. If you do it uh, twice, uh, will it overwrite the previous file? Or it, it will. It will uh, well, theoretically, it's possible to specify the file pattern, but it will also create for you two different files. With a, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be uh, there is going to be a suffix with a date time. Mm -hmm. And how, do you know how big is that buffer? Like how how much? Uh, it's configurable, I think, by default. Mm -hmm. oh. No, unfortunately, That's I cannot give you numbers, but it's configurable. Good, good, good. Thank you. <clears throat> So, and another uh, from the mind-blowing section, uh, but it also goes in the same direction when you would like to limit to narrow down what you're looking at. So the thing is that quite frequently, especially if you're developing something, you would like to profile only certain part of Postgres. So for example, you would profile on a certain function or something like this sort. And the problem is that when you're doing this normally, you still have to profile the whole backend, which is quite a problem, especially if the backend is loaded, quite loaded, and it's doing something, you'll get a lot of samples that are actually not interesting for you. Uh, and recently I have learned that actually it's possible to do this filtering uh, using a technology called Intel PT. It's actually, well, it's called Intel, but there is also something similar for AMD as well. So Perf actually knows how to switch between those, but the short keyboard for this in an Intel PT. So what are we going to do here is we're going to say, please um, sample Postgres for us, uh, but use an Intel PT event and filter only those samples that are going to, that has, has something to do with the function in this particular case, TTS buffer heap materialize. And sure enough, if you're going to sample Postgres in this way, you'll get only those stack traits that are going through this function, which limits and narrow down your essential line of sight. So you can concentrate on what's really important for you. The problem here is that I actually have not investigated that deep, but it's a very interesting situation. Postgres uh, quite frequently exposes functions in a, somehow in a multiple in a multiple way. So that, for example, if you look at them from the perf, from, from the perf, you'll see that there are multiple definitions of the same functions. I'm not sure why, but normally it's not a really big problem because, for example, when you're sampling something, perf just essentially create a dynamic trace points for all of them. So it's not a big deal. Unfortunately, this particular thing, Intel PT approach, is a little bit more sensible to it, which means that for uh, such multiply defined functions, going just to complain and you have to do an extra fiddling. But nevertheless, that's a very great approach if you would like to, uh, you know, uh, concentrate on something in particular. And now we are actually nearing the end of the presentation, so I'm just going to show a couple of things that are important to look after when you're working with the pro with with with, with a perf and in general with this approach. One thing I have noticed that not everybody knows is about event modifiers. You have probably noticed in the previous example that we were using event modifier as well, which was a user event modifier. And essentially, there are a couple of those. The most important probably are event modifiers that allow you to, for example, say, I would like to sample this event, but get on the user, par user space part of the stack. Because it makes sense for us, because we would like, for example, to understand only what's going up with Postgres. We don't really care about what was going down the line with the kernel. Or other way around, maybe if you're interested in the kernel, we can say, please collect only the kernel stack traces. Another one really important event modifier is a, a precise sampling. When we know that we have some uh, perhaps precise counters available, we could use them as well. And the last one is probably the most interesting because it's the, there is this buzzword BPF. It's an interesting event modifier that was also uh, implemented relatively recently that allows us to create BPF programs instead of a normal perf open event approach that is going to essentially do the very same sampling, the very same thing, but a little bit more efficiently in certain cases using BPF programs under the hood. And the last thing I wanted to warn you about is about frequency versus uh, count-based sampling. So uh, here on the screen, I guess, what is that? It's uh, essentially a step of uh, list of steps that you could do to create a flame graph. 
uh, if you do not have uh, like you know some fancy tool to do this for you you could essentially create those plain graphs directly using perf uh, there is even a python script inside the perf uh, repository itself to do this but i'm just using it directly with the flame graph tool itself and yeah sure enough if you will execute this set of steps you will get an interesting flame graph but there is a problem or like an annoying situation. And actually, there is an interesting blog that Mark Callaghan has written about this. The problem is that somewhere along the line, down the line, uh, the weights are getting lost, unfortunately. So the thing is that when you're using frequency, your sampling window is going to be of different size. And it's important to know about this. And unfortunately, uh, flame graph, I think either stack collapse or flame graph are actually not taking this into account, which is actually not really a bug because there was a problem somewhere even higher up the line. But nevertheless, the gist of it is that if you see that there is something strange going on on your flame graph, try to think about switching frequency based sampling to the counter based sampling, count based sampling. So we're finished. We're done, congratulations. Uh, you've made through this all a huge amount of information that I've poured on you. On this slide, you can see uh, all the terminal commands that we're executing throughout the presentation. You see there is a lot of them. So yeah, again, congratulations, you managed this. Uh, and you may actually would be interested to what, what was the point of this? Like it doesn't really have that much to with Postgres. And now comes the part when I'm saying that you are actually not exactly correct. Uh, from my point of view, makes a lot of things to do with Postgres. So the thing is, and I find it very interesting, so I think that Postgres finds itself in a very unique position in this sense. Postgres already leverages a lot of various features that, for example, underlying platform like Linux already provides. Just as an example for uh, would be like all these asynchronous uh, ideas, asynchronous engines that are right now under the development that were actually popping up right after the kernel has actually provided an interface for that. So it was a nice interface, user rings, that actually sort of triggered this whole situation. Uh, short, long story short, essentially, why to not make one extra step? Why to not be a little bit more friendly to people who are actually trying to use this approach? Because there is already an, an industry around this whole stuff. There are some other interesting projects that are using the very same strategy. So I'm pretty sure that if Postgres will essentially be more friendly in this sense, almost everybody will win. The thing is that I was talking at the beginning about different strategies, how to do this stuff and how to get information they're not uh, exclusive strategies. You do not have to choose sides, right? You can use both of those strategies to get the better perspective, the better understanding of what's going on. They're actually playing around quite nicely. They are completing each other. And uh, essentially, they will just let you know all the things that are going on on your database. So I think that's pretty much it. I have only a couple of links for you. So on this slide, you can see there is a link to a dynamic tracing documentation from the Postgres itself. There's a perf tutorial. Uh, there's an interesting documentation from Ftrace, quite worth uh, reading through. A lot of information you can get from BPF Trace uh, on the official repository. And yeah, the book I was mentioning, System Performance, very interesting uh, and uh, well insightful book. And as I mentioned before, an example with Ftrace was essentially heavily inspired uh, by an example from this book. Uh, that's pretty much it. And I'm actually, sure. I mentioned yeah. different book. This the, this book is uh, old but renewed recently. Uh, system. Yeah, the second edition. I'm talking about the second edition. Right, the main one. But there is also a BPF book. Uh, that's true. Was, yeah. yeah. So I, they're somewhat similar in the sense that, like, yeah, because the, it's the same author and the author is doing quite a lot in this community. They are, they're they're sort of if you if you wish they're covering different ground, but the strategy is still the same on both of them. And the system performance in the sense is probably just a little bit more overarching because it gives you also a lot of you know other approaches, not only BPF uh, sampling, but also a lot of other things. For example, yeah, F trace as well. Yeah. I think it's a must read book for any engineer who is interested in performance in general. It's like Definitely. one of the best books. Uh, what warms my heart in particular is that uh, there is a also mathematical section inside this book, so we're, we're quite a worth reading. So for example, about different modes and distributions and so on and so forth. That's a stuff that you will not frequently find in such type of literature. Good, good. Well, Dmitry, this, is, this, uh, this was... Um, Awesome, I would say. Like this, this is was maybe the the most difficult talks we ever had. So to, for understanding, but I already see how like the like recipes. I will return to them to try and try to understand uh, them. Usually, later, so. 
yeah, usually I'm saying that the thing is that this whole uh, content is actually way over my own head, unfortunately. And the topic is indeed quite complicated, but I'm still enjoying actually, you know, experimenting with this. And that's what I'm trying to actually bring to other people too as well. It's just fun to experiment with this stuff. And it just happened to be that you also can get a lot of profit out of it. Right, right. In, in in like some years ago, we 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 had only a way like to use GDB to debug something. Like it was it was like only for hackers. This thing maybe not only for hackers already. DBAs should already think uh, start using parts of it. Absolutely. Like, in this sense, I actually wanted to mention that, for example, BBF trace, it's one of the such examples. So the the, the idea was like this: we are using BBF, right? So originally we were having at the very low level we have lead BPF, which is like for those people who are creating commercial project products. Then we have this BCC BPF compiler collection, which is also for people who would like to create something, but maybe like for admins or something, but they still would like to do some appliance around this. So you have to create some code. And BPF trace is just a logical continuation of this idea for those people who actually would like to use this without anything at all. It's just a set of on one liners that you can use to get a lot of information. And it's simple to use. That's the key point here. It's very simple and interface. It's just a pleasure to work with. So like there should be some people who call themselves like a BPF developer or a BPF programmer, like <laughs> so, sort of, my, yeah. my primary language. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much once again. Let me finish with words from chat. Uh, we have very few people actually this time, but I, I I just think like most of people were afraid or were scared about the topic. But uh, let me finish with uh, kind words. Uh, this was uh, like a fine uh, work of art. It will take a while to completely appreciate everything learned here. Thank you. This is this Thanks is from so. our chat. Thank you so much for coming. I I will definitely rewatch this one once again at least once. So, <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for inviting me. That was also quite interesting to deliver this information as well. Right. Oh, everyone, please, uh, who reached this point, you, you must like uh, at least this video and subscribe, uh, bell button, everything, and, and uh, please share with your colleagues. This is super useful information, in my opinion. Okay, that's it. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Yes, I've seen the bush, I'm